Okay, good afternoon and welcome everybody uh, in person and online. Um, thank you for joining us for Trimaran, Real Load Aware Scheduling in Kubernetes. Um, would you all join me in welcoming um, Abdul Qadir from PayPal and Chen Wang from IBM. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Those present here, and greetings to my uh, my greetings to those virtual present virtually. So I'm Abdul Khadir. I am a senior software engineer at PayPal. Uh, I'll be presenting on load aware scheduling with my collaborator Chen Wang, who is a research scientist at IBM. Uh, so the image you see here is of Trimaran. So what it stands for is like a three hulled boat, which provides more stability and safety in the ocean. All right, let's get started. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, we'll go over the motivation, the background, uh, and the problem definition, followed by the trimaran architecture, the design, and the plugins we contributed to the open source community. The first one is the target load packing, and the second one, the load variation risk balancing plugin. Uh, then we have a demo, uh, and then some of the challenges Trimaran faces, how we overcome them, uh, followed by good practices in using Trimaran in production, and some future work that we have to do. So let's get started with further ado. So as many of you may know, Kubernetes provides a declarative resource model for uh, its pods. What I mean by declarative model is that the resource usage that you define for your pod or the container needs to be defined in a spec before you're able to run it and run your workload. And the core components in Kubernetes, namely the kubelet, the scheduler, uh, they honor, honor it to behave consistently with respect to the quality of service guarantees. Now, given this, the uh, developers, they tend to over-provision the resources with this model, uh, which, you know, one of the reasons is that they want to avoid the penalties of evictions and CPU throttling that the Kubernetes would do. Now, one way to solve this problem of declarative uh, model is to benchmark your applications. But uh, we, we know that like it could be cumbersome to do for all your uh, production applications. And in general, uh, estimating real load is hard. Now, with that background, the main problem we are trying to solve is that the default scheduler in Kubernetes, it uses allocation-based scheduling model and uh, it can lead to under-provisioned nodes in terms of resources and uh, fragmentation, of course, across the cluster. What you see on the right, bottom right, is a graph from 29-day uh, Google Trace in their cluster. And you can observe here that the uh, usage is about 40% of the requests, which implies a lot of it is over-provisioned. Okay. Now, moving on to the uh, primer and design and architecture. So around the time we started working uh, on this problem, the, uh, cube, the scheduler provides Kubernetes uh, scheduler framework. It was in uh, beta API, and it was moving towards uh, stable. So we decided to leverage it uh, to contribute our plugins in. Now the framework, uh, it provides flexibility to extend the scheduler in uh, different APIs. And uh, Trimaran plugins, they do so in an extension point called scoring extension point. If there's an upcoming talk by uh, six scheduling folks, uh, and you are more than welcome to attend that if you want, if you're interested uh, in a scheduling deep dive. Now, for a given scoring plugin, uh, what you have is like you get an input as a set of nodes, and what you output are different node scores for that uh, for for those nodes. So that depends on the algorithm you define in your scoring plugin. So in the diagram, you can see that the Trimaran plugins are part of the uh, Kubernetes scheduler. So they run in the same binary. Uh, now, the next major component in our, in our design is the uh, load watcher. So load watcher can be defined as a cluster-wide aggregator of metrics, which is backed by a third-party metrics provider. Uh, we'll, I'll explain in the next slide uh, what all metric providers we support. Uh, the load watcher also maintains a cache in memory for uh, fast lookups whenever the plugins need to uh, talk to the load watcher to get the live metrics. Uh, 
It also maintains uh, its cache in, in a DB to provide some fault tolerance if there is a failure and fast recovery during restarts. Uh, more in the next slide about Load Watcher. So another way to think about Load Watcher is that it is sort of a wrapper which uh, unifies metrics from different providers into a common format that uh, the Tramadon plugins understand. And uh, the currently supported ones which we added are Prometheus, uh, SignalFX by Splunk, and the uh, native Kubernetes metrics provider. It can be extended by the users to support any other metrics provider, provider if needed. Now, from the diagrams, you can see that there are two options of using the uh, load watcher. So first one is that you can use it as a service, uh, and then the second one is as a library. So each one of them has their pros and cons. It's up to the users to decide uh, what works best for them. For example, in the case of uh, using it as a service, uh, you have a separation of failure component from the scheduler process. And the uh, API, additional API call latency from contacting over the network, it can be minimized if you use like a local container through the uh, scheduler pod. And the other point is that it scales separately from the Kubernetes scheduler. So this is important for us because in the future we want to make it a bit more complex by adding uh, machine learning models, which could make the uh, watcher process more CPU intensive, and uh, we don't want it to compete with the scheduler for resources. What you see, on the other hand, on, if you use it as a library from uh, the plugins inside, uh, you have, of course, no API call over the network, which is important uh, when you have fast scheduling cycles. Then you have a much simpler deployment. Uh, we at PayPal use it as a service, and Red Hat folks, they, they integrated uh, Trimaran in their product offering on Kubernetes, OpenShift, and they use library as in, in their offering. What you see in the rightmost column is a sample data that the load watcher uh, process maintains in the cache. So it maintains windows of different metrics that are needed by the plugins, and the window durations range from 15 minutes to five minutes, and we use each one of them as needed depending on the use case. It also adds some more uh, metadata to enrich the uh, watcher cache. Okay. Coming to the meat of the design, uh, so for the first plugin that we contributed, uh, there are two main objectives we had in mind when we designed the target load packing plugin. The first one is that we want to achieve high utilization across all the running nodes in the cluster. And basically, we want it to be around a given threshold that we can set before we run the plugin. And we do so uh, by packing the pods uh, as long as the CPU utilization uh, is under the given threshold. The other objective is to maintain some sort of safe margin for uh, CPU usage spikes which can happen due to unpredictable loads. So we would like to do that by spreading the, the, the incoming pods onto the nodes, which can result in higher safety. Higher safety here implies that there is more uh, left over CPU cores left. Uh, here's, some, here's the algorithm for the target load packing plugin. I'll try to uh, explain that in simpler words. So, what you see on the right is a graph uh, of the different scores that, that the plugins provides versus utilization. Now, the Kubernetes framework, uh, it supports, it wants, it wants the scores in the range 0 to 100. So a, a node, if it is scored higher, it means that it has more chances uh, to be selected for scheduling. So the first line you see is an increasing function. So as the utilization increases from zero to 50, uh, we favor the nodes by scoring them high. This implies the bin packing I talked about, that we keep packing the pods on the nodes. Now, at, as you reach 50%, that is our threshold utilization. The graph uh, shown here is like for the uh, utilization of 50, by the way. So there is a drop, there's a discontinuous function. So what that implies is that we would like to penalize nodes, which are trying to exceed the utilization that we set for the, as a threshold. So uh, we try to favor the nodes lesser as the utilization goes beyond 
Now in point number uh, two and three, it just explains uh, how we calculate the incoming pods uh, usage because we, we don't have the usage metrics for it yet. So we predicted, predicted based on uh, it's different based on the quality of service of that uh, specific pod. If we have both requests and limits, then uh, we, we, we specify the limits as the usage, or more like the prediction. And then if there are no limits, then we have a multiplier for the requests. And if, there are, if it's the best effort pod, that is no requests or limits, then we assume uh, some number, which is a minimum utilization. So that said, another way to look at the algorithm is that it switches from a best fit variant of bin packing to least fit variant as the utilization changes from zero to 100. Okay. So here's some results from an experiment we did uh, with about 100 nodes and 400 pods. Uh, we did this using an open source tool uh, called KDS Cluster Simulator with some changes to incorporate out of three, pl out of three plugins which is what we contributed. So the pods here have a uh, stable QoS, so the limits are larger and different than the requests. And uh, they have a normal distribution of utilizations, which remain uh, constant throughout, throughout the time they, they run. Now, the graph on the left you see is for the native Kubernetes scheduler, and the graph on the right is for Trimaran. Now, there are multiple uh, Observations you can make from these two graphs by analyzing them. The first one is that the area that you see under the threshold mark, the red line that you're seeing, is much higher for uh, target load packing, which implies better capacity utilization across the cluster. The second one is that there are lesser number of hot nodes uh, in the case of target load packing. By hot nodes, I mean that any nodes which exceed the of threshold utilization that we uh, had as an objective. So they are, they are minimized in the case of uh, target load packing plugin. The last one is that there are less number of fragmented cores. So the way you can tell that is, so each bar here respond, corresponds to a specific node. So the variance in the height of the nodes is much lesser in the case of target load packing. So that implies uh, there are lesser number of fragmented cores as compared to the default uh, scheduling. Okay. Moving on to the next important question for production, how well does uh, Trimaran perform? So these tests were done uh, in scheduler perf tests from the Kubernetes main repo. So just for the background, it is what Kubernetes uses to publish their uh, scheduler metrics so that they know that the metrics, for example, the latencies, the algorithm latencies, and the end-to-end -end port scheduling duration is within the SLOs or not. So we modified that to include our own plugins. And uh, so we did two experiments here. The first one is that we used 5,000 nodes and 1,000 pods to schedule. The other one is with 500 nodes and 1,000 pods. There are same 500 number of init pods in each of them. These are like a set of standard tests which you can use to compare. Now before, and we can see that the Trimaran beats the default scheduler in both of the experiments. Now, before I explain why this happens, I'd like to mention that the uh, default scheduler, it has a set of scoring plugins uh, that are configured by default. Now, Tremaran uses two lesser plugins than what is present at default. So essentially, you have like one less plugin compared to the default. So first reason for uh, the performance benefit is that there's like one less plugin who's doing scoring, so it is faster. The other one is that we optimized the plugin to uh, use fast JSON encoding and decoding libraries. And we have a background uh, thread that fetches, uh, fetches metrics from the load water cache so that it, isn't, it, it prefetches before each scheduling cycle. Okay. So moving on to my last slide. This is about, um, the status of Trimaran at PayPal. As I explained, uh, so, the, so the main use case for us uh, working in infrastructure team is to maintain and assure efficiency of the fleet. So PayPal relying on the cloud 
we would like to also minimize the costs. Now this translates to the uh, technical requirements I mentioned for target load packing plugin, the objectives. One thing I didn't mention is that we also have a requirement for the replicas of an application to be spread across topologies. By topologies here, I mean it could be nodes or node pools or uh, different zones, for example. So that said, we combine our plugin, the target load packing, and uh, pod topology spread to achieve these requirements. The current status is that it is uh, actively tested in, uh, for, for deployment in QA, followed by production. So this will be uh, enabling efficient fleet for a majority of the PayPal applications. Over to my collaboration. Okay, thank you, Abdul. So um, next, I will introduce the load variation risk balancing plugin. Uh, that is designed to solve an issue we observe in uh, one of our production clusters. So we observe that um, even the nodes will have different, um, will have the same average utilization. When you consider the preference to schedule the path, they may have significant different load variations. And uh, it's very important to account the usage variations on nodes when scheduling paths. Namely, the higher variations of load workload you have on a node, the higher risk you will have to schedule that path. And then if the path runs there and there's some birthday workload, you will easily end up with like pod evictions or some performance issues. So this plugin is designed to balance such a risk. So let's take, an, uh, take a look at an example. Suppose we have two nodes, like each has a capacity of eight CPUs and only five are requested on both nodes. And in that case, those two, two nodes are deemed equivalent uh, when the default scheduler is trying to schedule paths. And then it can forfeit in both nodes. And then if we can only consider the average utilization, and you may have exactly the, the same average utilization on both nodes. So considering the utilization, average utilization, you will also regard these two are the same. And then, um, so, but if you look at the variations on these two nodes, apparently on node two, at peak usage, the maximum utilization is much higher. So the scoring plugin we want to propose is to consider not only the average utilization, but also the variation on that, uh, on that node. So if a path can fit in both nodes, in this case, in order to minimize the risk of over committing, at the peak hour, it is much safer to choose node one than node two, right? So to better understand what we are actually balancing uh, based on what we can balance based on the average and standard deviation, uh, let's just draw all nodes average and standard deviation in a mu sigma plot, where mu is um, the average and sigma uh, uh, refers to the standard deviation. So when your scheduler is trying to balance the average utilization across all nodes, and their uh, node utilization will look like the uh, top left chart, where, where it is the um, vertical line and all nodes average utilization are the same. So if you want to balance the variations on, on, on available nodes, it will look like the horizontal line on the red, red part, top left plot. So if you want to balance something like the, your variation is proportional to your average, it looks like the lower left chart. I don't know if there is a practical use case for that, but it's a very good illustrative example to explain the last one, which is balancing the risk. So the higher average utilization you have, you want lower uh, variation on that node. And the higher variations you have, you may want lower uh, average utilization. And it will look like this line, and um, which is basically mu plus sigma equals to some constant. So this is exactly how we designed this uh, scoring uh, plugin. So assuming you have a um, uh, path coming and it's uh, requested resource, let's denote it as R, 
And then specifically what the algorithm is doing is it is going through all the nodes. For each node, it's going to get the sliding window average and the standard deviation of resource utilization. And then it used the average utilization plus the arrival path request as the prediction of the future average utilization on that node. And then, um, so we also use the standard deviation we observed in the past time window to assume uh, uh, assume it will be similar in the future time window. And then if we plus them together, just as what I have shown in the uh, graph in the previous chart, it will be our risk. So we want to balance this risk. Of course, we want to bound, it, bound the risk in a range like zero to one, and then so we can scale it up to the priority score. And the, because it's lower risk you, you have, the higher score you will uh, prefer to choose that node. So it's one minus zero um, multiplied by the maximum priority score. And then finally the scheduler will just choose uh, whatever is the highest score. So next, I will show a simple, uh, two simple demos on how our two plugins uh, can be deployed and uh, how it behaves in, in a real cluster. So here we are in a cluster of three nodes and uh, we are going to first deploy the target load packing, um, load packing plugin. So let's take a look at details what you want to create. And then uh, including a service account you want to use for this scheduler, uh, all the RBAC rules that are needed by the scheduler plugins, you want to bind, uh, bind this, uh, these roles with your service account, including uh, the, also the uh, cube scheduler um, cluster role. And then you want to create a config map to uh, wrap all the scheduler configurations there. Uh, and within that config map, you want to disable the confl conflicted plugins and enable our target load packing plugin. So here the important parameter to configure is for the target load packing is like the percentage of utilization you want and the endpoint of your measure provider. And then we can mount it um, to the deployment of the scheduler where we just use the upstream uh, uh, scheduler plugin image. So we go ahead, create a namespace, trimer one, and we see the trimer namespace, we deploy this scheduler, and we can also uh, see if it's running now. So I record all the demo because the whole demo will run for like an hour, and we can speed up a little bit in deploying those workloads. So now we log into the scheduler um, pod, see all the detailed messages. And then we go ahead to take a look at the workload we are going to deploy in the cluster. So this is a simple hamster application. Um, it's used around 400 millicores, uh, but it's requesting only 200 millicores. And we are going to see the target load packing will pack nodes up to the um, predefined utilization percentage. So here we prepare a simple script to generate the workload, and then it will create a pod um, every once in a while. And uh, totally we can define how many pods we want to create in the cluster. Um, And what it does is just replacing the ID in the pod template. So totally we are going to create this pod 36 times. And here I speed up a little bit uh, because it will run uh, for longer. And uh, on the lower bottom window, you can see the target load packing, uh, plugins, uh, logging some messages on bending pods. On the, and on the right hand side, the first one is the actual pod usage versus their request. The second one is the, the utilization on each node. So what you are seeing is it go ahead to pack on one node until reaching the target utilization percentage, and then it starts on the other node. 
And the third one is the number of paths, testing paths scheduled on that node. So similarly, it starts packing on one and then spreading to, so when all of the nodes reach to like uh, the target utilization, the uh, scheduler will try to spread the paths across nodes to balance the risk. Okay, next, let's take a look at the uh, load variation risk balancing plugin. So similarly, we will create all those service account, uh, RBAC rules, and deployment. It's all in our documentation. You can find it in the Tremoran plugin uh, uh, repo. So I will explain a little bit on the right hand side. On the right hand side, uh, we will have a testing pod request versus their usage, and also the, the CPU utilization on all nodes. Sorry, this is. Okay, so it was re replaying the previous uh, demo, yeah. Here we have the, the behavior of the node version risk balancing plugin. Uh, in the cluster, we have three nodes on the left showing their uh, allocable resources and the variation of the usage on each node. You, in the middle, we, see, uh, we show the statistics of the average and standard deviation. And then we go ahead to create a testing workload. This workload is just a simple stress workload with some variations. So now we are creating a testing uh, work, uh, namespace for the workload and create the path. And on the right hand side, we have all the logs from the load version risk balancing plugin. You can see the details about like, uh, it is computing the CPU and memory average utilization and standard deviation. And it adds them together to compute the risk score. And then based on the risk, it's coming up with the, uh, the score. And it actually also combined the resources. So if you have a higher score on CPU but lower score on memory, it will always choose the memory, uh, the bottleneck resource score. So now you can see um, there's bigger variations on the first node and the third node. And that's why even uh, their average utilization are similar, the path will eventually be scheduled to the middle one. Okay, so just a summary. If, what if we have a birthday arrival of paths and during that time we may not have enough metrics changing and then we, we, we collect the metrics like every five minutes but when you have like 100 paths arriving in one minute and then it's not reflected to the nodes what we do. So in that case, the metrics would be missing, but we, we, we still have the previous utilization window and also the arrivals of power. So we can use the arrivals of power to predict what would be happening in the next time window. So for those paths with requests and limits, we always count with the limit. So if you have 10 paths arrived and each one is requesting um, one CPU, we add up to 10 CPUs. And then for those paths with only request values, we can configure a multiplier to leave some safe margin of your inaccurate prediction. And then for those paths of best effort, you can also configure what might be the threshold for your, uh, for your pod request, uh, pod usage. And in the case that one provider is not accessible, one metric provider is not accessible, we can always fall back to the uh, metric server solutions. And uh, you can also, like in the future, we plan to use multiple metric sources and do cross-validation in the load water. So if one metric provider fails, we can switch to the other. 
So from development of tests and testing of these plugins, uh, we learned several lessons throughout the way. Uh, first, we should be very careful about how frequently we retrieve metric data. So the load on metric providers are not uh, acceptable. You are not overwhelming uh, like uh, Prometheus. And, uh, but the interval should not be too large. Then we have like outdated metric data. Um, so, and this is exactly why we introduced Load Watcher Library, which only fetch data from providers periodically and cache it in the scheduler plugin. And um, so it's ready to be used whenever the pod arrives. And second, we, sh we should always have a fallback solution, especially for plugins that um, use a lot of metric data because metric provider can uh, be uh, inaccessible. Third, it's important to not use complicated uh, plugins together. For example, target load packing is targeting the average utilization, and then the load variation risk balancing is targeting both average utilization and standard deviation. So they have some conflicted objectives. You should not use them together. So, but even with Tremoran plugins, uh, we can never predict the load variation or uh, load usage 100% accurately. So you can always end up with some over-provisioning uh, node uh, if the pod usage climbs up. So here are some future work we want to do. First, we want to integrate load watcher with, uh, for example, descheduler to descheduler pods based on their actual usage to solve an uh, reported issue I show here. And the second, uh, we plan to include some additional resources such as I.O. and natural boundaries. And here we propose a new uh, proposal, new cap proposal in the community called Network Award uh, Scheduler Proposal. And it doesn't only consider the bandwidth allocation, but also the latencies uh, requirements you may have uh, in either a distributed cloud or in a data center cloud. And in the future, we will also want to try some machine learning models to have a more accurate uh, prediction of utilization of our uh, load work schedulers. So here are some references uh, if you want more details. And lastly, we would like to uh, express our appreciation to those who cannot attend the conference in person, including Tan and Rina from PayPal and Arthur from IBM Research, they are both, uh, all contributors to this project, and we really appreciate help from uh, all members in the SIG scheduling uh, team. And here is questions. <laughs>